to invite our keynote speaker of today's event, Professor Max Arminias. Professor Max holds a chair in the Faculty of Law, University of Oslo since 2008. He has been a professor of forensic science and has the teaching responsibility for the subjects corporate law, financial market law, comparative provide, uh, private law, and human rights. Before inviting Professor Max, I would like to read out the preamble. It states that we, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic, and to secure to all its citizens justice, social, economic, and political liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of status and of opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation. In our Constituent Assembly, this 26th day of November, 1949, do hereby adopt, enact, and give to ourselves this Constitution. May I now request Professor Max to come forward and share his knowledge with us. Professor Max. And you all, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to speak on your uh, great uh, uh, Constitution Day. In Norway, our National Day 2, of course, as most of you will know, is our Constitution Day. In other countries, they have uh, the birthday of the Queen, uh, some battle, or and, and in many countries, of course, independence, which is no joking matter. That's, that's a serious in, in most traditions. But uh, we share this idea of the Constitution and the idea of constitutional patriotism. Um, it's not nationalism, it's not uh, excluding anything, but it's, a, it's an abstract idea of the Constitution as something which unifies, gives rights, and organizes the way in which we are governed, and also the whole legal system. And I, I would like to say something about uh, uh, my core task here today, which is to talk in particular about Article 51a of the Indian uh, Constitution with its 11 fundamental duties. Uh, and um, I, I, I will then focus uh, on, for instance, the first fundamental duty, which is to abide by the Constitution and respect its ideals and institutions, the national flag and the national anthem. And then I'll, I'll say a little about um, uh, national flag and national anthem. And I'll also say something about the Norwegian constitution in that context. Now, um, what's the relevance of the Norwegian constitution? Not very much, I expect. I mean, it's because we are all in Norway. I mean, the Indian constitution is uh, the constitution of a large uh, country, one of the most important countries in the world, and also a constitution which has been stable. You know, it's, if you're thinking about um, uh, what we would have said in the 1930s, or perhaps even after the, the Second World War, the British Empire or the, the common law, um, then, of course, the Indian constitution is, in real terms, the oldest and most stable of the constitutions in that broader field. That's something to remember in these days where uh, the British uh, in the United Kingdom are fighting over their unwritten constitution and their general principles. And if you are thinking about the challenges that uh, uh, 60 million or how many there are uh, in that country uh, have as, a, as a, with a, a relative uh, uniform background, history, ethnicity, um, well, that they could have such constitutional problems and you can have, of course, immense challenges in Indian politics and governance, but still the constitution as a framework is there and has provided a base uh, ever since its adoption. Could I uh, point uh, to a couple of difficult issues? So, for instance, whenever we are talking about duties, in a constitutional context or in a rights context. 
um, international human rights lawyers, for instance, are very concerned. Because they say that if you talk about duties, particularly when it comes to the rights of individuals, you are concerned. Because then you think, this will say you could limit somebody's rights. So, for instance, you have a prohibition against torture. You have a prohibition against uh, arbitrary detention. Now, if you have duties, would that mean that you all of a sudden could abridge those rights based on the duties that the individuals have? Now, this may come as a surprise, but in 1992, the European Human Rights Court, presided over by the recently retired Norwegian president of the Supreme Court, Rolf Ustal, said that, well, even if you were a terrorist, an IRA terrorist in, um, on Gibraltar, and you were executed, well, then you had rights. You had rights not to be executed on the street. The majority was a majority of one vote. And this is 1992, I think. One vote majority. What did the minority say? Well, basically, you have put yourself, set yourself outside the protections of the law and of rights because you were a terrorist. Now, we're all uh, not uh, primarily concerned with the rights of, of terrorists, I'm, I'm sure, but the idea that you take away rights of people because you define them as terrorists, that's something which is unacceptable in the rule of law. But just to see, in Europe, in the beginning of the 1990s, you said, these people broke, violated their duties, they have no rights. So that's a problem, isn't it? Uh, that's still there. So some of the old human rights lawyers in the international uh, human rights law in the United Nations and other contexts would be very concerned the moment you talk about duties. But then we have to break this up and deconstruct it a bit. And uh, when uh, the UN was working on the um, Universal Declaration, which comes at the very end of the 1940s, you know, it's a parallel process with the Indian Constitution. It's a very parallel process and a complicated process. The, Univer the, the Universal Declaration, the UN Declaration of um, Human Rights, was, it, well, it did include duties. It included rights in the classic, uh, if you like, uh, uh, civil rights context, rights not to have, well, for instance, uh, for instance, to suffer arbitrary detention, torture, um, deprivation of property without compensation and all of these things. The, 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 the core, if you like, traditional civil rights. It included that, but it also <coughs> included a broader set of social rights. And in addition to social rights, it did include the concept of duties, although it was not uh, given any emphasis. And there was a member of the drafting committee for the Universal Declaration from India. That was very early because, of course, India's independence is, is taking shape in this period, you know, because uh, w what did it mean in an international context? Uh, its independence in relation to the United Nations and other international bodies was still reshaped in this period. You get the Indian member. And then the, the French member, René Cassin, the, the great uh, uh, human rights uh, uh, pioneer, was concerned with this idea of duties. So you've got duties into uh, the thinking, although it's not focused much on. The other big issue was, of course, economic and social and cultural rights. And there there was a divide. <coughs> so that the communist world there and the the new uh, independent nations of the previous colonial Asia and Africa, they stood up for economic, social and cultural rights. So Western Europe, the US, uh, civil and political rights in a narrow sense, uh, guarantees against interventions by the state, um, the rest of the world, focusing more on economic, social and cultural rights. 
What will that mean of difference? It's what it meant, for instance, that the state could not say, we don't intervene in a negative way, then all is all right. Economic, social and cultural rights will, even more than civil rights in this narrow sense, mean that the state has a duty to act. The state has a duty to act. Now, uh, where is the Indian constitution in this? It has it all. It's a modern constitution, which includes all these rights in different ways. It includes also duties, and then uh, it provides for a system where the political bodies have duties, but there's also a role for courts. I was, uh, I was given a very generous introduction, uh, very kind. Before I, I got back to Norway, I was 18 years in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. and I taught at, uh, at the King's College, Oxford, Cambridge, and then I was director of the British Institute of International Comparative Law. And there we always used the Indian Constitution and the case law of the Indian Supreme Court, because it very flexibly devised remedies. Uh, for instance, in the context of making rights effective, different kinds of group actions. It also injuncted the political authorities or the administrative authorities or other authorities uh, having other uh, responsibilities, typically in relation to the justice system, to, op to respect rights in a very specific way, which we still do not see in the Euro any of our European systems. So then, looking to what the Indian courts did, and of course in, in London, uh, cultural <coughs> uh, links meant that we always got a number of senior uh, uh, Indian uh, uh, officials from the uh, justice sector, and, and of course judges visiting. So I, I hope we must prevail on the ambassador to, to help us get some of these uh, um, uh, eminent people from the Indian system who could tell and learn us something, teach us something, which, from whom we have much to learn in terms of how one we'll makes constitutional rights um, effective. And then to uh, say, uh, to, to turn to um, uh, the um, uh, constitutional uh, provisions here. And I, and, I, and I just wanted to say that, uh, um, uh, for instance, then, we're now in 58, 51A, the provision about uh, fundamental duties. So the first duty A is then to abide by the Constitution and respect the ideals of the institutions, the national flag, and the national anthem. Now, in Europe, uh, the flag and the national anthem is a controversial concept because it can be used for extreme uh, nationalism. You know, when you, when you wear a pin in your flag, uh, then in most of Europe, when the Americans start to do that after the 11th of September, many Europeans, and that's also mainstream or conservative Europeans, would say, well, last time people did that was uh, in the 1930s and 1940s. You know, that's a bad memory. Also, flag and um, uh, or too much focus on the flag and national anthem has these negative connotations for some. In the Norwegian con in the context, as, as all of you would know, we are completely uncritical. We run 17th of May with the flags and we sing the national anthem in a way which is uh, well, <laughs> I grew up with it, I feel comfortable with it, but I'm a, a bit anxious now and then. Perhaps it's a little, little too much, you know. <laughs> but, 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 of course, as Norwegians, we, as, as, as you know, we, we, we like to say, see this as a very inclusive thing and we think it's wonderful when people dress up in the national costume and wave the flag and all that. Now, there are issues there which we have to be a little more critical about in our context. <laughs> But, but, the flag was an important part of our independence process. It was actually beyond belief in the, in important for us. It was the fight with the Swedish crown and the Swedish dominated government that the independent Norwegian parliament legislated uh, to have first on international trading vessel, uh, commercial vessels abroad, the flag, um, and, and then 
the process which went on. So we have in our constitution, not from 1814 when the constitution was adopted, but from our modern constitution, we have a specific provision about the flag. It says the, the, the colors and forms form of the national flag should be determined in legislation. Why? Well, uh, that's an outcome of the conflicts with the Swedes then, in, in the dual monarchy of Norway um, and Sweden. The national anthem is not in our constitution, but uh, it's now a political issue. And I think in many ways it's not very controversial. I don't think it is. But uh, it has perhaps some uh, aspects or connotations which are not completely uncontroversial, but I think uh, practically everybody, I'm not sure any of you, if, if you think about the Norwegian uh, national anthem, you, you would think that's Javjelske, and nobody would find that problematic, and if people legislate for that, that's all right, isn't it? If Parliament wants to do that, I can't object to that. Um, but um, uh, the um, uh, Article 51a, if we continue, it says, to uphold, to uphold and protect the sovereignty, unity and integrity of India, to defend the country and render national service. I mean, again, the Norwegian constitution has provisions about sovereignty, the territorial integrity, which actually goes much further, it's much more detailed than the Indian uh, constitution. And that's, uh, well, remember that these provisions in the Norwegian constitution came in with the original constitution in 1814. And then it was to limit the autocrat monarch to go to war and then win a bit of territory, or go to war and lose, and having to give up a bit of territory. Uh, the autocrat shouldn't have that kind of power over the nation, over the territory, over the people. So that was the background in our constitution in this early 19th century uh, context. And national service as well, that you should have national services in our constitution, and the idea was that you shouldn't have a monarch who could pay uh, for an army which could be used against the people. And that's a French, primarily a French revolutionary ideal, which then was important also for the Norwegian civil servants and some very few wealthy farmers who formed the Constituent Assembly then in 18, 1814. And then harmony and common brotherhood. It's C here. Now, at the time, that cultural concept was not important for the uh, Norwegian uh, framers of our constitution. They basically spoke Danish. You know, if there was any official um, uh, context, they would speak and write in Danish. Among themselves, uh, most people would speak dialects, which could be very different. Uh, the cultural aspects. I wouldn't say dominated very much, but of course this has meant much more for us and, and today we have anti-discrimination provisions and particular, a particular provision in the constitution to protect the rights of the, the Sami minority population. And there's uh, in, in G a provision about uh, to protect and improve the national environment. I know that that provision is used by the Indian Supreme Court in a way the Norwegian courts so far has refused to use the constitution to protect uh, the environment. So again, to get an Indian judge who could tell us this is what good judges do when they're going to use the constitution and they can use it to protect the um, environment. Now, <clears throat> if I was going to round up, round up uh, and, and, and conclude my, my intervention. It must be that, uh, uh, of course, the Indian constitution is a much more complex document than the Norwegian constitution. It's a big nation. Now, it meant also something different because it was the end of a colonial area with new ideas of social equality, uh, the end of discrimination. There were terrible aspects of the colonial regime, and I expect of society in general, one wanted to counter by this legal order. Now, the provisions we are looking at, um, the provisions we are, are, are looking at um, in, uh, when, 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 when we are uh, looking at these 11 fundamental duties in the Indian uh, constitution, well, um, they are of a general nature. They are of a general nature. Uh, 
um, they are uh, then giving this constitution uh, a particular force and uh, if I look at these different uh, reasons to be a bit concerned, you know, which you always have when you are looking at constitutional provisions, how can they be abused? I would say that, uh, that <coughs> uh, 51a is an important uh, uh, provision. It, the way one has given <coughs> duties to individuals are wholly uh, acceptable from the point of view of the rights and the general constitution, from the constitutional perspective, and I think it served the constitution and the Indian society well. I'd be a bit more difficult, uh, I'd be a bit more concerned about trying to copy it in Norway because I don't think uh, it is, it'll be a different constitutional context. I think uh, we have just updated our human rights provisions and we, we should perhaps leave it. But what we can learn from India, I think in, in particular uh, in the years ahead, is from the way in which you have uh, your judges giving effect to the constitution in the way uh, the uh, affairs of state and individual rights um, are being practiced in, in your country. Thank you very much for inviting me.